Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Taryn Mason with Fostering Wellness and Randolph Chiropractic and I would like to welcome you to our webinar on immunity where we're going to talk about how you can supercharge your immune system. I tried to keep this um, condensed so we're not going too too heavy into any of um, like the ultra science details. Um, I want to give you guys stuff that's very practical that you can use at home tomorrow, things you can put in place. Um, to get your immune system pumped up and ready for this cold and flu season that is about to be upon us. Um, so let's get going. First of all, what is your immune system? What's it do? Uh, your immune system's basic function uh, is to gather information on pathogens and diseases, and then your immune system creates ammunition to destroy these foreign invaders. So let me just define uh, pathogens real quick because I'm going to be using this term again and again. Pathogen would be a bacteria or a virus or any other microorganisms or it could also be fungi or mold that can cause illness or disease and these things um, when they get into your body they attack it but your body recognizes it and creates a plan of attack to kill these pathogens um, and get rid of them so that you can stay healthy and well. Um, so it's basically like you have your immune system is your body's own little military that's uh, protecting you and keeping you safe. And it has uh, some specific defense mechanisms. Our first lines of defense, basically, of our immune system are first our skin, which forms a physical barrier between uh, your insides and all of the dangerous pathogens on the outside. So you've got that physical barrier of your skin. Um, and then we also have mucus. So where we don't have skin, basically, we have mucus. So we have mucus um, on our eyes, in our mouth, and in our nose. And that um, actually traps foreign invaders, and they basically get stuck in that gross, slimy mucus, right? And then we also have cilia. It's these little hairs that sweep out particles that get trapped in the mucus. So those are our first lines of defense. Um, so what are the immune organs? So first of all, there's the bone marrow. And you guys have heard of bone marrow. It's found in the long bones. Um, like here, it shows it in the humerus, also the femur. That's the long bone of our leg. Um, and bone marrow produces blood cells. It produces red blood cells, white blood cells, so there's five types of those, and also platelets. Um, so white blood cells, those are the ones that we're going to be talking about um, in this webinar. White blood cells basically are um, the things in your body that recognize these foreign invaders, um, basically create a way to destroy them and destroy them, destroy these pathogens. Um, and particularly we're going to talk about T cells later. So if I were use the word T cell or referring to these white blood cells that are formed and made in the bone marrow. Um, another immune organ is the spleen. What your spleen does is it filters out old blood cells, old red blood cells and toxins, um, that, which that protects you from disease because if we have all these uh, toxic buildup in our body we're going to get sick. And then it also stores extra white blood cells. So you, I shouldn't say extra, but it stores white blood cells. So you have this reserve of white blood cells who are ready to attack if um, if a pathogen gets past those first lines of defenses, the skin, the mucus, the cilia. Um, there's also the thymus, um, which programs white blood cells to their specific tasks. So think of it like boot camp. It's what matures, <laughs> matures the white blood cells, and then um, it trains them to their specific job. So it's really, really important that the thymus is functioning so that these white blood cells can do their jobs the way they're supposed to. And then there's also the lymphatic system. And that's a system that removes toxic waste um, from your tissues and also is what transports the white blood cells around your body. And then there's also the tonsils, which are these things basically at the back of our throat. Um, and it's a mass of lymphatic tissue that produces lymphocytes, which is white blood cells, um, and traps and kills bacteria that's entering the mouth. So we've got all of these defense systems that are working in our favor. Uh, we just have to make sure that they're working, right? So your immune system can do what it's supposed to do kill the pathogens, you stay healthy and well. So, we're going to have a little quiz now. You guys can answer out loud. I can't hear you, so I can't judge your answers. <laughs> um, but here's our quiz. Is it a healthy response or a sick response? Coughing, what do you think? Uh, so when we cough, if you, are, if you have a cough, right, people would say, well, I'm sick. But coughing is actually a healthy response. Coughing expels germs and excess mucus. You literally are <coughs> forcing it out. Same thing with sneezing. When you sneeze, you're removing irritants um, and germs and other toxins. When you when you sneeze, you're forcefully expelling them and also excess mucus. 
What about fever, healthy response or sick response? So again, a fever is a healthy response. Um, when you have a fever, your body's temperature rises, right? So it actually kills that invader, it kills that pathogen using heat, and it also speeds up your metabolism so you're able to get rid of waste products quicker. What about vomiting? Um, when, we think, when we think of like vomiting and diarrhea, that kind of goes with food poisoning, right? Um, is that a healthy response or a sick response? Again, that's healthy. If you if you go eat some some you know bad food that's got um, like E. coli or something in it, right? And then you start vomiting and have diarrhea. That is your body getting rid of the pathogen. It's expelling it out of its system before it can take a foothold in your system and really, really do some damage. So that's a healthy response. And again, like a running nose, that's your body getting rid of excess mucus and running it out and running, um, basically letting that, um, that invader, that pathogen, that bacteria or virus run out of your system. So these are all actually healthy responses. When we're doing these things, we think of ourselves as sick, but that's a body's healthy response to a foreign invader. So it's actually good when our body is doing these things. But what do we do? We treat symptoms. So we take Tylenol to bring down a fever. Or um, some people might think aspirin, and let me just say this, please never take aspirin for a fever, particularly don't ever give it to a child that can actually be very dangerous. Um, but Tylenol um, for a fever, right? And it's going to help bring down that fever and maybe help with some of that body ache. But the body's healthy response was for you to have a fever burn out those germs or that virus, it's trying to heat it up and kill it, and when you bring down that fever, you're inhibiting your body's healthy response. So you actually want to let that fever run its course. Um, what about a cough suppressant like Robitussin or a lot of cough uh, medicines have hydrocodone in them? That's suppressing your body's reflexive cough, and the reason again we're coughing is to expel that, that virus, usually with a cough, or that, that pathogen that's inside of our airway. You're expelling the mucus, you're, you're actually forcefully expelling uh, that pathogen, and when we take a cough suppressant, it inhibits our body's, again, intelligent, innate ability, um, what it's trying to do to get rid of the thing that's making you sick. Um, you can, mucinex, which dries up the mucus. So when you have like that running nose, you have your body's producing this mucus that's trying to trap those germs, trap that bacteria, so that you can then get it out, um, but if we take Mucinex to dry it up, it might take care of your symptoms, it might help you feel like you could breathe better, but your body's going to have a harder time getting that thing out of your system. Um, so all these things just cover up your symptoms, but do they really help the body heal? They don't. So we're going to talk about some things you can do when you're actually, when you're feeling sick, when you're having these symptoms, we're going to talk about those later. But now I want to talk about kind of the challenges that we face. These are some unique challenges that we face today with, um, that our immune system faces. One, toxic exposure. We have um, chemicals, cleaning agents, molds, pollutants, and pesticides. All of these things cause free radical damage in your body and suppress your immune system and also uh, cause DNA damage and make you age faster, which nobody wants. Um, and the more industrial we get and the more um, like plastics and stuff we're using, even like the, the skincare stuff we put in our bodies is just loaded up with chemicals and so your body becomes more and more toxic, and you're just always trying to fight these, um, fight these toxic wastes, and it's hard to keep the body healthy. Also, nutrient-lacking foods. So many of our foods, um, due to pesticides, GMOs, and mass production, they lack the nutrients that they used to contain. Um, so you might have heard, like, spinach is good, full of iron. That's why <laughs> Popeye would eat his spinach, and he'd get super strong, right? Um, but spinach... Uh, that's been mass produced and genetically modified isn't going to have the same iron content that it did when it was back when we tested um, what minerals and vitamins these um, foods contain. Or like you know we're talking about the immune system, people think of vitamin C, they think of oranges, eating oranges for vitamin C. But again, our, a lot of our foods that are supposed to be good for us and have the nutrients that we really need um, are lacking in those because basically the soil lacks nutrients because of the way that we used it. And so now the food isn't getting those new, as many of those nutrients from the soil. Um, so one thing there I would just suggest, you know, maybe a multivitamin is a good idea so that we can make sure that we're getting those right nutrients. Also um, eating things that are grown locally, um, maybe having your own garden. I'm a little biased. I have a garden and I love gardening. Um, 
or eating, you know, um, stuff from a local farm stand that's less mass produced, that's organic. Um, that sort of stuff is going to be more nutrient dense because we're going to talk about some foods that do help your immune system. Um, and then another um, challenge, maybe this isn't unique, but a huge challenge we face today is lack of sleep. Uh, when our sleep is interrupted, your immune system can't d complete its defense cycle, and so it just it, it lowers your ability to fight disease and fight illness, and it lets those pathogens take a stronger foothold when you're when you're not sleeping. Uh, some more unique challenges: sedentary lifestyle. As we're more of a um, industrialized society, we stopped um, you know being outside and farming, and people are inside, and we sit at desks, uh, we sit at computers and we come home and we sit on the couch and so we become very sedentary. Um, what this does, I mean there are a lot of negative effects for this, but if we're just specifically talking immune system stuff, your lymphatic fluid is actually pumped through muscle, um, through your body via muscle activation, so that's your muscles working, your muscles moving. Um, so if you're not moving, that lymphatic uh, fluid just, just sits there and so it isn't um, moving those white blood cells through your body and it isn't helping remove waste from your tissue. So again, this just causes us to be sicker. Also, another big thing that this is um, something we've become more concerned about in the last several years, but antibiotic resistance. So antibiotics, something you'll often take when you're sick, when you have a bacterial infection, we'll take an antibiotic and that will kill that bacterial infection. It kills bacteria. Um, it's pretty effective. But if there are some bacteria that don't, um, that basically survive the antibiotic, they will breed more bacteria that survive the antibiotics and we create um, bacteria that are antibiotic resistant and we don't have a drug that can kill these bacteria. And the more we, the more antibiotics are overused, the more we're going to create these superbugs. Um, so that's actually kind of a scary thing that this, um, you know, generally pretty effective medication um, overuse of it has caused creation of superbugs. And then these we're going to talk a little bit more about, but we have chronic stress. Um, we're going to talk quite a bit about this because this is kind of a, I don't know if it's my passion, but chronic stress is something I just think plagues most of my patients, and so we're going to talk about it. And then um, the standard American diet, which is what this lovely picture here depicts. Um, it's sad. Standard American diet um, just is not um, doing our immune system any favors. So chronic stress. Um, this is what happens when an organism fails to appropriate appropriately, I can say that, respond to threats. So stress in short term, um, short stresses. So um, if I am playing a sport, uh, you know, then I, I get this stress response right before I play and my body kind of amps up and pumps up, but it actually helps me have a better athletic performance for say an hour or two hours. Um, but if I'm chronically stressed, my body is always amped up and always ready to just, just go, go, go. N no machine or human can always go, 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 go at top speed. And so things start to break down. So it's when, so this chronic stress happens when we fail to appropriately respond to threats. It's basically we're feeling threatened all the time and that's when things start to break down. Um, Today, so stress for our early ancestors might have been like lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, but it's those short term things like you see a predator, you run or you fight it, short term. That's good, that's okay, that's a positive thing, that's what was supposed to happen. But today our, um, in modern America, our major stressors come in the form of finances, work, family responsibilities, and health concerns. And we are stressed about these things all the time. 77, my goodness, it's a, it's a I'm recording this on Monday night, and clearly I'm having trouble talking. 77% <laughs> of Americans regularly experience physical symptoms caused by stress, and 73% regularly experience psychological symptoms caused by stress. 77 and 73%, so can we just say there's three-fourths of our population regularly experiences these symptoms, physical or psychological. And I would love to say that that 25% of that quarter of our population that's not experiencing these symptoms, I love to say that that's our children, because I hate to think of that children are chronically stressed. But I know, you might know, it might be your kids. We know kids who are on anxiety medications, kids who are on antidepressants. That is a result of children that are chronically stressed. Kids shouldn't be chronically stressed, guys. Um, so we all look at some deeper issues. Um, but 
I mean, I don't I also don't know who these 25% of the population are. I think they're people who know how to manage their stress. I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, I want you to know what chronic stress does to your immune system and what it does. So the stress hormones, big hitters here, are cortisol and vasopressin. Um, cortisol, like I said, stress is supposed to be a short-term thing. So like your cortisol is supposed to spike in the morning. It's supposed to go up in the morning. It's a, it's a glucocorticoid. It's a hormone um, that your body produces. And in the morning, you know, you're asleep, you're relaxed, and then you wake up, you got to get up and start your day. It spikes, so it kind of gets your body ramped up to start the day, but then it should go back down. But when we're chronically stressed, the body is always ramped up. So what this does, cortisol is the primary hormone responsible for the stress response. Main role is to return the body to homeostasis, falling exposure to stress. So like I said, it helps get the body going after like the stress of having to wake up in the morning. So that should happen for like an hour um, or less. Uh, but what happens is if we're, again, we're chronically stressed, if we're always producing cortisol, it's always working really hard to return your body to homeostasis. Nothing can work at 100% all the time and not break down. Um, it also blocks the proliferation, that's a hard word for me to say for some reason, of T cells, basically um, the, the growth and the spread of T cells. And T cells, I mentioned before, are white blood cells, and they're, they're responsible for recognizing pathogens, recognizing these foreign invaders, bacteria, virus, other dangerous microorganisms, recognizes them, and basically um, figures out how to attack them and destroy them. And so it's blocking the pro proliferation of these T cells. Uh, our immune system is not going to be functioning the way it was designed to function, right? It's not, it's not going to work at its best, and our, these pathogens are going to have a chance to get a stronger foothold in your system, spread, make you sicker and sicker. Um, and also, plasma cortisol levels, basically the plasma in your blood, increases up to 45% after sleep deprivation. So we talked about one of the things we face is lack of sleep. Um, I think a lot of us suffer from lack of sleep. That increases your cortisol level, which makes you feel more chronically stressed, which makes it harder for you to sleep, which increases your cortisol level and it becomes a very positive feedback loop and I don't mean positive in a good way I mean it keeps feeding itself um, so we've got to break this cycle and then vasopressin a uh, little less exciting but it decreases one of the big things it does is it decreases urine formation which leads to water retention which increases your blood pressure increased blood pressure over long periods of time heart disease stroke heart attack right we all know that we don't want high blood pressure Blood pressure should spike in response to a stressor, but it should be a short-term stressor, and then it should come back down. Like before I do a public speaking thing, or before I do a webinar, it stresses me out a little bit. My blood pressure goes up, but then it should go back down afterwards. Um, so vasopressin chronically being produced, it's also um, a hormone. Um, when our body's chronically producing this hormone, um, it causes... Um, long-term increased blood pressure. It also decreases your waste elimination if we're decreasing your formation. Um, so we want to be eliminating those wastes, right? So that the body is less toxic. Um, other things that chronic stress do to our body and specifically do to our immune system, chronic stress decreases the, thi the size of the thymus and its ability to mature T cells. So right there, uh, that guy right there, um, that is the thymus. Um, so your thymus, we talked about earlier when we talked about the immune organs, it um, programs your T cells and tells them, the white, white blood cells, and tells them what their job is and how to go about doing it. It helps them mature, right? We call it the boot camp um, of your little immune system military. Um, so if we're decreasing the size of its thymus, it's decreasing its ability to do its job. So now we have less T cells running through our system um, that know what they're doing. Uh, and then also, um, chronic stress changes the morphology, basically like um, kind of the structure and function of the spleen, and it affects its ability to, to contribute to the immune response. Remember, the spleen um, filters waste but also stores extra white blood cells. So these are pretty significant things that chronic stress are doing to our bodies. I mean, it's changing the structure and function of, of these organs. It's pretty crazy. Oh, uh, yeah, so that's chronic stress. So next is our um, standard American diet. I said that was one of the other unique stressors that uh, I want to spend a little more time about, or not unique stressors, but unique challenges that our immune system faces. 
So this little graphic is from the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, and it's telling us what our diet is made up of. So 51% of our diet is from refined and processed foods. This is what the standard American is eating, 51% of their diet from refined and processed foods. 42% comes from dairy and animal foods, and then just 7% comes from fruits and veggies. And if you guys have attended my Life You Save class, you'll know that you hear me say over and over again, fruits and veggies are not synonymous. They're not the same thing. So 7% of that is coming from fruits and veggies, but veggies, or sorry, not veggies, fruits have a lot of sugar in them, and so 7% of that is coming from fruits and veggies. How much is actually just veggies? Because I, I want you to have more veggies than fruits. I want you to have more veggies than all of this stuff. Um, so that's the standard American diet. Um, this is a graphic from Standard Process, which, again, if you've been around our office, you've probably heard us talk about them. Um, they're a supplement company that we use. Um, but the info on here is just kind of sobering. 70% um, of the U.S. diet comes from processed foods. And this um, is different than the 51% in the last graphic because in here they did include frozen uh, fruits and frozen vegetables and processed food. So that's why that's a little bit more because frozen, it's processed, it's processed. Um, but still, that's, that's a pretty sobering thing. Um, Americans spend 10% of their disposable income on fast food. Uh, let me catch this. I believe it was, I have it in my notes, one in four Americans eat fast food every single day. Every single day. Americans consume 130 pounds of sugar per year. That comes down to three pounds of sugar per person per week. One American consumes 130 pounds of sugar per year. Sorry, so three pounds of sugar per person per week. That is a ton of sugar. Um, more than one third of U.S. adults are obese, and so that's just not that's not overweight. That's obese. That's like the that's up a level. Um, and then in the early 2000s, 60 percent of all middle schools and high schools sold soft drinks in vending machines. These are kids who are just getting loaded, loaded, loaded with sugar. Uh, you know, when they hang out after school. Uh, fortunately, in 2014, some legislation got passed, and that is happening less and less. Um, but in the early 2000s, 60 percent, which is just like a, st a staggering number. Um, we wonder why we have childhood obesity. So basically, sad, the standard American diet, because it is sad, it has a ton of sugar in it. Well, we said three pounds of sugar per person per week. And I, I mean, I can tell you, I don't eat three pounds of sugar per week. So there are people who are eating just way, way more of that, in excess of that. And if you guys, um, if you're regular viewers of our, web, viewers of our webinars, um, and you saw the power of self-healing, I talked a lot about how sugar um, decreases your immune response, decreases your immune function. Um, this is one of the reasons why. Uh, I know I told you I wouldn't get too, too technical. Um, but here on the, um, to my left, I think you're looking at it, it should be on the left, um, is a structure of glucose, which is sugar, okay? And then on the right is vitamin C. These are their molecular structures. They're very similar. Um, we all have heard, I assume that we all have heard that vitamin C is good for you when you're sick. People are like, oh, take vitamin C. Um, actually, I'm going to tell you a funny story. Um, but basically, uh, your white blood cells, the ones that recognize these pathogens, find them and attack them and kill them and destroy them, your white blood cells uptake vitamin C, and vitamin C is part of what helps them destroy these uh, bacteria and viruses. But because sugar and vitamin C are very similar in molecular structure, if you're consuming a lot of sugar, your body will, the white blood cells will uptake the sugar rather than vitamin C, and then these white blood cells are not as effective in doing their job because they need the vitamin C to really do their job. Uh, so again, this, this lowers your immune response. Um, so, so if you consume lots of sugar, you just, you're not doing yourself any favors. Um, so my husband, Cole, he's going to watch this and feel embarrassed. <laughs> he um, got sick one day, and he, he doesn't get sick very often, uh, but he had a cold. And he comes home with like a gallon of um, orange juice, and we don't drink juice in our house because juice is like a ton of sugar, um, but it's a, a gallon of orange juice, pulp-free too, so there's like none of that fiber in there, just a gallon of orange juice. And uh, within like a day and a half, he's drank the whole thing, and I was like, what is going on? Like, you're sick. What are you doing? He's like, yeah, I'm sick, so I'm drinking orange juice. Why? He goes, because it got vitamin C in it. Your store-bought orange juice? I mean, I... Uh, 
a lot, a lot more sugar than vitamin C. He was not doing his immune system any favors. If I even drink like a bunch of juice, I'm gonna get like a canker sore, you know, like on these guys on the side of your, um, like on the inside of your lips, because that's what the sugar does is it lowers my immune system and, and it causes these, those little blisters in your mouth. I, yeah, so orange juice, not the best option when you're feeling sick. There are other uh, ways to get vitamin C into the diet, just FYI. <laughs> um, so we're gonna talk about what you can do to supercharge your immune system. So that's all the stuff um, that re that, that's hurting your immune system, okay? So toxic exposure, lack of sleep, um, our food, losing um, its nutrient density, essentially, chronic stress, standard American diet, um, all these things are hurting your immune system, immune function. So what can we do to supercharge it, right? Manage your stress. This is my biggest thing. Like, this is my, like, axe to grind. I feel like I can, um, you know, really work with patients and get people to start moving more and get them to exercise. Um, I feel like our patients, um, you know, really want to get healthy and we can get people to start eating a healthier diet and to get, get um, you know, decrease the sugar and those things that are hurting your immune system and your overall health. And, you know, we can get people to start eating better. Um, what I feel like I, I have not figured out how to successfully do is to get people to manage their stress. And I think it is the main thing that inhibits people's ability to heal is this chronic, chronic stress. So you've got to manage it. So just a couple of pointers. Find ways to relax. Um, one moderate exercise is an excellent way to reduce your stress. Um, some people need vigorous exercise to, <laughs> to reduce their stress. And that's okay if that's what you have to do. Um, just for your body's overall health, moderate exercise is great. Um, if you come to my Life You Save class, I talk a lot about this. But spending time with positive friends. Um, you know, say you come home from work, or you know, your work day ends, and, and, it's, and you're stressed. Okay, work has stressed you out, uh, you know, your boss is a jerk, whatever. And then you go to happy hour with your girlfriends or you go, you know, you go out with the boys and all they do is complain about work and what they're stressed about. And then you just complain and everybody's just being negative and, and my spouse is this and, and, and all, all these people are doing is complaining and being negative. That is contributing to your stress. It has not, it has not relieved your stress. Um, so if you spend time with positive friends, and I'm not saying people who ignore all of the bad things things and just like turn a blind eye, but people who just take a positive outlook, maybe be optimists. Um, if you spend time with people like that, it's going to help you to be more positive, um, and that will really reduce your stress. Um, I also recommend beginning a meditation practice or, or prayer. Um, just spending this quiet time to kind of be inside yourself um, is amazing, amazing for reducing stress. And actually, again, I talk a lot about that um, and the power of self healing. Um, again, shout out to my husband, Cole. We had company staying with us a few weeks back and he was like, so if you get up in the morning and Taryn is just sitting there staring um, quietly, uh, just ignore her. <laughs> but that's how I have to start my day. You know, I have to start my day with some quiet time and prayer and journaling um, and just really getting myself ready to deal with my day so that when something stressful comes about, it doesn't, it doesn't mis necessarily trigger my stress and it's something I can just deal with and um, not let it chronically um, affect me. Also, uh, learn to say no. This is uh, a huge lesson in my life, uh, but learn to say no to things so that you're not always just feeling drained and always feeling depleted because you're saying yes to absolutely every opportunity and every time someone asks you to do things. Um, if you hang out in our Randolph office, we talk a lot about having boundaries with people, and I think it's, and you will see the next one, I think it's important to do kind things for other people, but you also just have to know what your limits are and you have to be able to say no. Um, but also, do something kind for other people. And I want to just say this to moms, I don't mean your children, okay? Uh, because you are giving yourself to them all the time. Uh, and dads, you do too. I just tend to find this a bigger, um, maybe a bigger thing with moms. Um, but do something kind for somebody like outside of your family circle. Um, be kind to a stranger. It is amazing what looking outside of your, you know, looking outside of your problems and helping someone else that maybe has bigger problems, um, can do to, to reduce your stress. And then do something kind for yourself. So go get a massage. Um, go get your nails done. 
Uh, guys, go to the shooting range, you know, like have some man time by yourself. Um, or guys, go get your nails done if that's what you like. Um, Dr. Foster totally has gotten manicures. Um, but do something kind for yourself. I have a patient uh, who gets her um, fingers and toes done every other week, and she tells me it's cheaper than therapy. But seriously, it is. Uh, if you do that nice thing for yourself, uh, it really helps to manage that stress and kind of um, help with those psychological symptoms that we feel as a result of chronic stress. Um, next, to help your immune system, pay attention to your sleep. Are you getting enough sleep? Um, are you getting quality sleep? Or are you tossing and turning? Um, this is, again, like kind of a huge like um, axe to grind for me. Um, people, you know, research says that we need to get six to eight hours of sleep per night, but it's not just laying in bed for six to eight hours. If you're tossing and, and turning, that's not quality sleep. You're not getting into the REM sleep that helps your body repair and helps your nervous system run, or not your nervous system, I'm sorry, your immune system run through its um, full, like, cycles. Um, so you really need to get quality sleep. So one, get rid of blue light. So it's, it's evening time and I've got this light shining on my face right now. Um, this is basically telling my body it's time to wake up. It's time to go. Looking at a computer screen like I am right now, it's, 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 a, it's blue light. It's a spectrum light that's going into my eyes that's telling my body that it's actually morning. Um, so it's causing my body to produce more cortisol and it's going to make it harder for me to go to bed and get into REM sleep. And so I really do try to work on this, but I'm doing a webinar for you guys right now, so blue light it is this evening. Um, so if you can turn off the TVs, uh, the cell phones, the iPads, if you can get away from those things um, about an hour before bedtime, that's going to help you get better quality of sleep. It's going to help your kids get better quality of sleep. Um, and I will just tell you one hack. Um, you can get glasses that help filter blue light. And I, I don't wear any sort of prescription glasses, but I do have a pair of glasses that I will wear at nighttime if we're watching TV before bed or if I'm um, doing email or something on my phone before bed. Um, I will wear these glasses and helps filter out that light. And I have noticed I get better quality sleep when I'm doing that. Um, and then also, um, again, a little bit of a hack, but try supplementing magnesium. Again, we talked about um, a lot of our food is lacking in nutrients, and magnesium deficiency is one of the one of the most common things um, in our population today. And magnesium is responsible for over like 300 pathways, uh, like metabolic pathways in your body. It's, Important for a lot of things, but one big thing is it really just helps your body relax and um, get more quality sleep. So just try supplementing magnesium before you go to bed, and that that's a nice little hack, I guess. Um, get away from the standard American diet. So get processed sugar and simple carbohydrates out of your diet. Again, they inhibit your immune response. Your body cannot fight off infections and diseases as well if it's loaded up with sugar and simple carbs. So get those out. Um, eat more fresh vegetables and moderate amounts of fruit. I think fruit is great, and we're going to talk about um, a couple fruits here, I think, in a minute. Um, but really, like, if we're looking at your plate, like, it should be mostly vegetables. Um, I like to treat fruit as a dessert. Um, I think that's a really good way to go about it. And then also get healthy fats into your diet. Um, if you know me well, you know that I love avocados. I'm a huge fan of coconut oil. Um, olive oil for like salad dressings, um, you know, nuts and seeds. As far as nuts go, I don't super recommend peanuts because those tend to actually have a lot of mold on them. Not that you can necessarily see, but they tend to be moldy. Um, but like um, macadamia nuts, almonds, um, cashews are one of my favorites. Uh, but those things are full of healthy fats. I am not delving um, a ton into nutritional stuff tonight. Uh, because we have a webinar called Eat, where we talk a ton about food and healthy nutrition. Um, I think we have another one, Purify Your Body, where we talk about it as well, so you can check out those webinars. Also, come to our Life You Save class. Um, we super delve into nutrition there. Um, so there's just other places where we can get into that. So, But those are kind of the simple things, all right? Um, get away from the standard American diet. All right, and also get off the couch, all right? So we talked about sedentary lifestyle is a problem. So if you're going to supercharge your immune system, if it's going to work, you need to move your muscles so that you can pump your lymphatic system. So go for a walk. Uh, practice yoga or Pilates. So like this is like moderate, less intensity exercise. It helps your body uh, detoxify through movement, um, but also helps with stress. Um, join an exercise group um, or exercise class. Um, I hear there's an awesome Zumba class in Randolph, uh, I'm just saying, um, but if you if you join a group like that, uh, just the social interaction tends to be um, good for your stress, <laughs> just 
always come back to that because uh, everybody's stressed. Um, but also, if you join a group or a class, it, it's it's uh, more likely that you're going to keep up with it rather than if you're just doing something by yourself and no one's holding you accountable. Um, go for a swim. I think um, I love swimming just because it's easy on your joints. Um, so that's a great way to stop being sedentary is to just get yourself moving, get yourself swimming. Um, so even if your joints aren't super healthy, um, you should be able to swim. Um, and then also um, get off the couch and go sit in a sauna. So you can still sit here, um, but if you sit in a sauna, you sweat and sweat. I mean, one of the reasons we want to move, sweat helps your body detoxify and helps you dump toxins. Um, yeah, so it's always good to get a good sweat in, and a sauna is one of the best ways to do that. So you can find a local gym or spot that has a sauna, and that's great for you. All right, vitamin C. We kind of talked about uh, vitamin C a little bit earlier. Um, basically, your white blood cells need it to attack um, to attack these pathogens, those, those invaders. Um, so great sources of vitamin C, green and red peppers broccoli, kale, um, oranges, and grapefruit. So these are food sources that are high in vitamin C. We did talk about our food tends to not have all the nutrients that it used to many years ago. Um, so it is a good idea to supplement with a multivitamin. I mentioned the company Standard Process a little bit ago. They have a multivitamin called Catalin that I'm a fan of. Um, it's a good quality multivitamin. Um, supplements, you know, um, very. So I, I recommend going with a company you trust, and they are a company that I trust. Um, but if you're buying local vegetables, you know, I, I grow my own. Also, I'm a member of a, um, a CSA, and so I um, have locally sourced vegetables, so those are going to tend to be um, higher in these nutrients. So again, green and red peppers, broccoli, kale, oranges, and grapefruit. There are lots of other foods that have vitamin C in them, but these, here are some pretty um, basic ones accessible to everybody. Um, you know, kiwi was another one, but those may be a little harder to get around here in Vermont. Um, but those are some you should be able to find most seasons um, that are going to be packed full of vitamin C. Uh, so you want to make sure you're getting that in. But don't highly recommend supplementing vitamin C. You can. Again, you've got to have a supplement company you trust. There is a ton of people selling vitamin C out there because, again, we all know it helps with our immune system. But you can buy a lot of crap. So I would just be careful about that. And then, I'm a chiropractor, right? So we're going to talk about getting adjusted. Um, this was like really cool research that was done back in 1992. But basically it showed an increased respiratory burst following a thoracic spine adjustment. Um, so thoracic spine, let me grab my little pointer here. It's like this part of your spine, right there. I'm pointing. Oh, wait, no. There. Sorry. Hard to figure out my mouth. My mouth. That's what the about um, the thoracic spine. Um, and getting a thoracic spine adjustment, you have a, a, an increased respiratory burst. I'm not going to get into all of what that is. Basically, you have a stronger immune response following an adjustment. So we tell all of our patients, and we tell you right up front when you become a new patient, don't cancel an appointment because, because you're sick or you have a cold. We're not afraid of your germs. We get regularly adjusted, and we live the chiropractic lifestyle. So all the things I'm talking about uh, that help supercharge your immune system, we do um, for the most part. Um, so come in, get adjusted, boost your immune system if you're feeling sick. Don't wait until you're sick. Get adjusted. Keep your immune system working strong so that, so that you don't get sick and you stay healthy. A um, couple of things just with chiropractic and your immune system. This is a really cool study um, put out by the ICPA, but basically each time a chiropractor adjusts someone's spine, we replace the negative information that is flooding, oh this isn't the study, sorry, that is flooding the brain with positive information. Oh, gosh, I can do this guys. You can read, each time a chiropractor adjusts someone's spine, we replace the negative information that is flooding the brain with positive information. This recalibrates the brain to help store the release of chronic, help stop the release of chronic stress hormones and allows overall health and healing to occur. So again, this is one of the, for me, I love my job. I've always understood that chiropractic works. But when I'm feeling stressed and I like, um, am dealing with chronic stress, I'll start to feel a little anxious. But the only thing that stops that cycle for me is an adjustment. So, you know, I can exercise, uh, do, do, do yoga, um, you know, relax, meditate. But about the only thing that stops that for me and replaces that negative information is an adjustment. And, um, you know, Dr. Renee has given me that adjustment before where I'm just like, I, I've arrived at work and I'm like, man, I don't feel good. Like, I don't feel like being here because, I, like, I'm not, I feel like I'm not myself. She adjusts me. I go, huh. 
feel myself again. I'm normal. I've replaced that negative information with positive information. And just real quick, for those of you, maybe you were just trying to get and hear about some stuff about the immune system and you don't know anything about chiropractic, um, this, this picture here um, is of the safety pin cycle. And so chiropractic is so simple. The reason it helps with your immune system, the reason it, you know, it causes that respiratory burst, we're not, we're not treating the immune system with a chiropractic adjustment. We're not treating stress with a chiropractic adjustment. What a chiropractic adjustment does is it reconnects the brain and the body. Chiropractic adjustment removes interference from your nervous system. So your brain and your body talk to each other through your nervous system. And if they're talking to each other, you're in a place of ease, you're in a place of health, you're in a place of wellness. Things are functioning the way that they were designed to. But if a bone in your spine moves out of place and causes irritation to your nervous system, we're in a disconnect now. Brain and body are not talking to each other at 100%. And that is dis-ease. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a sickness or disease, but the longer you're in a state of dysfunction, the longer your nervous system isn't working at 100%, your immune system isn't working at 100%, you're going to wind up with disease and illness. The longer we stay in a state of dysfunction, that is just the, that is the outcome at the end if we don't correct it. So our job as chiropractors is to reconnect that by removing that subluxation, that bone that's moved out of place, irritating your nervous system. We remove that, brain and body return to communication, they return to ease, and your body starts healing. Your body, my body, is so much smarter than I will ever be. It's smarter than you will ever be. Our bodies are so innately, I mean, they were born intelligent. They were created intelligent. They know how to heal. This is just so cool. This next slide, I have uh, some research done by the ICPA. Yeah. Uh, so this is just a case study. But after multiple painful ear infections and failed tympanoscopy, tube surgery, that's where they put tubes in the ears to help, help uh, drain when children are getting chronic ear infections, uh, a four-year-old boy began chiropractic care. So he had had the surgery for his ear infections, and it, w and it failed. Uh, vertebral subluxations, that's the bone out of place causing irritation in the nervous system. Vertebral subluxations were found and adjusted in the cervical and thoracic spine. So that's neck and then that part of your back I, I showed you before. Um, so sorry, were found in the cervical and adjusted in the cervical and thoracic spine. On the third visit, the mother opted out of her son's scheduled surgery. So he had failed a surgery, they were going to have another one scheduled. She opted out of it because the child was improving. The child attended care with the recommended frequency at two to three times for the first two weeks of care, followed by once a week for eight weeks for a duration of 12 weeks. Chronic ear infections were resolved in this four-year-old boy. Guys, the body was designed to heal. That chiropractor that took care of him, this was published in the Journal of Pediatric Maternal and Family Health Chiropractic. Um, the chiropractor who took care of that child was not treating that child's ear infection. They were just finding the bone that was out of place, putting it back into place, letting the nervous system do what it was, or do what it was designed to do, and doing what it was designed to do, the immune system started working and it started beating that infection and getting rid of it. That's incredible. What was causing that kid's infection, the, the bacteria or virus that was causing that kid's ear infection, that didn't go away, like it didn't disappear, but the body started winning the fight with that pathogen. And that's amazing. That was what the body was designed to do. We weren't designed to be sick. Um, the body was designed to be healthy and well. But again, these challenges that we face that I talked about before um, have, in, have impaired our body's ability to fight these infections and diseases. Um, so it's just so cool to see stuff like that happen. And this is just one of many, 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 many case studies like this. Um, but I just thought that was cool. And four-year-olds are just my favorite, so I wanted to do that one. Um, so what do you do when you are sick, okay, when you're not feeling well? What do you do? Rest, okay, guys? Again, if your body has been chronically stressed, go, go, go. Your immune system was, de your entire body was, is depleted, but your immune system has not been functioning. So now you've gotten sick, you need to rest. You need to let your body repair. Um, stay hydrated. So we got to make sure we get lots of fluids in us um, because that helps our body dump the toxins and dump, um, dump the crap that's kind of built up in us. Um, if you're having like a mucousy type sick thing, um, using steam or humidifier really helps um, help that to like soften and break up so you can cough it or sneeze it out because it's important that you be able to get it out. Um, breathe clean air. So if you um, basically like if you're in a moldy environment and you start to get sick and you continue to breathe that moldy air, it, it's going to be really hard for your body to kick that. So you need to breathe clean air. Um, avoid sugar and dairy. So we talked about how sugar... Um, basically depletes your body's ability to fight off um, these pathogens. Um, dairy is like super, um, makes your body kind of produce excess mucus. Um, so like if you have like a sinus infection, you drink and, and you're consuming a lot of dairy, drinking milk, whatever, um, that kind of uh, 
it just keeps the body sick, basically. Um, it's hard for the body to get over that. So um, that's not, you want to avoid that. Um, we want to sweat, okay? So I talked about going and sitting in a sauna or do a moderate exercise. When you're sick, I certainly don't want you doing anything healthy, but again, maybe just move through some yoga, move through some Pilates, wearing like um, sweaters or something, but like help your body to sweat and you'll kind of help sweat out toxins, almost inducing your own fever. Um, and also vitamin C is great. Um, because again, your body needs vitamin C, the white blood cells need vitamin C to effectively um, attack foreign pathogens. Um, I did not give you a ton of supplements to take. I, I mentioned, I think I mentioned vitamin C and magnesium. There are a couple others, but I want you to understand we don't want to just treat symptoms with supplements, just like we talked before about treating symptoms with, you know, Tylenol, Robitussin, Mucinex, whatever. Um, really, it's about doing these things before you get sick, taking care of your body before sickness happens so that it doesn't happen so that you stay healthy and well and again if it does happen here here are some things that, that are going to help you out but I, I don't want to just trade uh, drugs for vitamins all right um, it's really about helping your body to do what it was designed to do your body is so much better at this than the drugs are um, but if we're not getting the right nutrients um, it is hard for it to do its job so vitamin C is a good one and then what else do you do call your chiropractor right um, so we have Fostering Wellness, we are chiropractors um, that are really just concerned with reuniting your brain and your body, um, communication, re reuniting that um, flow of your nervous system so that it functions uh, the way that it was designed to do so that your body uh, can heal and you can live optimally. So I know that we do these webinars and I gotta say a lot of the advice sounds the same. Uh, we talk about dealing with your stress, we talk about exercise, we talk about nutrition, we talk about getting adjusted. Um, Guys, boosting your immune system, it looks a lot like doing the things that you need to do to stay healthy, okay? Um, so I, I do hope that you learned something, that you got something valuable here tonight um, or today whenever you're listening to this. Um, it's always a pleasure um, giving you guys information. I think that knowledge is power. Um, so thanks so much for taking your time to listen to this. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please call us. The numbers are there. Uh, like us on Facebook. We're always uh, posting some fun information um, on Facebook. So again, knowledge is power. You learn lots by following our Facebook. Um, and just thank you so much. And I would just like you guys to go out and make someone smile and make it a great day today, okay? All right. Thanks, guys.